right, we're live. I want to welcome everybody here tonight, those of you at home watching on Facebook and all of our folks that are here tonight with us in person here in our church sanctuary. I thank you for being a part of our study tonight, and I invite you now, take your Bible, and let's go back to John chapter 20, and let's finish looking at verses 19 through 23 here. So as you're opening up your Bible tonight to chapter 20, verses 19 through 23, and hopefully we're going to finish up this chapter tonight, and hopefully, you know, good Lord willing, we'll get all this done. So as you're opening up your Bible, though, let's take this time to God in prayer. Gracious unto Heavenly Father, thank you for being here with us tonight here in your house, here in your sanctuary, your holy of holies. And we just ask you now to move in our midst with the power of your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit that also touched John and led him into bringing the gospel of Christ to life for us in his book. Use your same power now through the gift of your Holy Spirit to speak to us and help us to learn now, to grow closer to you and to Christ. And so once again, anoint us now. Bring your word to life for each and every one of us as we're gathered here and also gathered in our homes. We ask this in your holy, mighty, and very precious name. Amen. All right, if you will, join me now. Well, let's look again at verses 19 through 23 first off. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. All right, let's stop here for a moment. Now, if you remember last week, we finished up looking at verses 19 and 20 in this passage, and we talked about the greeting that it was more than just a simple, normal, everyday greeting of shalom, peace be with you. That if they were listening closely, closely, they also heard that with these words, Jesus was telling them that the Old Testament prophecies have now been fulfilled. The prophecies about the Messiah and the coming of the kingdom of God and the peace that the kingdom will now bring into this world has now come to be. And then secondly, it's reminding them that he is the source of of peace, where he tells us in John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And then the last thing we talked about last week, we closed up by answering that question, you know, have you ever wondered why the wounds had to stay on Jesus? And we shared about the fact that first, obviously, it was so the disciples would know that it was him. They could see him. But greater still, this was part of God's design because keeping the wounds makes sure that we know that we see that Jesus is the true Passover lamb. The true Passover lamb of God who sacrificed himself for the sake of the world. Well, now as we pick up tonight, look again with me at verse 21. Now there in verse 21, Jesus the second time extends his greeting to the disciples, peace be with you. And then he follows it up. Follows that second greeting up with these words. Now the New Revised Standard has it like this. As the Father has sent me, so I send ye. Now has anybody got anything majorly different there at this point? Uh, is it all basically the same thing? You know, as the Father has sent me, or as the Father sent, sends me, I send you out now. Any type of thing like that. The question is, but what is Jesus really saying now to disciples at this moment? Well, see, what it's believed is this, is he's now calling the disciples beyond the emotion of the moment. Now, you know, I think it's got to be an emotional time to be there, locked in the house, suddenly have Jesus appear in front of you. All your fears, your doubts, all your emotions are building up. He wants them to now go beyond the emotion of the moment into now understanding the mission, that there is a mission that now lies before them. And it's believed that he's wanting them to now understand three things about this. First off, that now just because he has been crucified, he's been resurrected, and is now getting ready to go back to Father, that none of that, you know, that none of this means what? That the mission is now what? 
over. The mission's not over. It's just getting started, okay? He wants them to understand that. A second thing he, they believe he wants them to understand is this, that even though the way the mission was being carried out has changed, uh, he was carrying it out. The way it was being done has been changed, you know, but it doesn't change the fact that the mission still needs to be carried out. The way it was done has changed. But the fact the mission still needs to be shared. Now, who's that a message to today? Who needs to hear that particular message? That even though the way it was done has changed, it still needs to be carried out. Who needs to hear that today? We do. The church. That's our message. You know, the thing is, the message is still the same. Jesus Christ. All right? Lord, in our Lord and Savior, Messiah, Son of God, died on the cross, rose from the dead. That message never changes. But if the church is going to succeed, if the church is going to continue carrying the message, we have to change. We have to be willing to change the way that we're going to do it. Because the world's always changing about us. We have to always be looking for new ways. And then there's a third way to understand it. That the disciples have now been charged with carrying on the mission that Christ started, that Christ taught them. So that means what? They do not need to start a new one, a new church, a new mission. Don't start something new on your own. Don't come up with your own ideas. Teach them what I have taught you. Tell them what I have taught, have taught you, told you. Don't start anything new. That's not what this is about. Carry on the mission, okay? But then it happens. Now look at verse 22. Now, in verse 22, we read about this moment that night, okay? And it's wonderful, but it also has a question behind it. Now, as we read about this moment that night, what other event should also come into our minds? We just celebrated this past Sunday. What other event should come into our minds when we read about what Jesus does here? What Sunday? Pentecost. We just celebrated it this past Sunday. Pentecost Day. Pentecost Sunday. The coming of the Holy Spirit. Now the question has always been concerning John. Are these two separate events? Are two different stories about the same event? Now some will tell you, all right, that it's very possible that what John is doing here is he's combining the story. You know, you've ever, you've seen that before. People combine things. Well, some will tell you that he's combining the story of the resurrection and the Easter story along with the story of Pentecost. He's bringing both of them at the same time. But is that really what John is doing here? Now, to understand what's going on here at this very moment, you know, and what will occur in 50 days, we need to look at both instances separately, okay? Now, I'm, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to test your Bible knowledge here, all right? Now, think back in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes, this is Pentecost, and first off, right off the bat, the Holy Spirit comes with a what? Do you remember? Not the, time, the times of fire, but the Holy Spirit first comes with what? as a wind. Some versions have a violent wind. Some have a great and mighty wind. But the bottom line is this. The first thing that happens is a wind comes, okay? A violent, mighty wind and it fills the entire house. And then what's the second thing that happens? What? I just said it. They get to speaking in tongues. Well, that's, that's afterwards. The second thing happens what? The wind comes and then what appears? The tongues of fire appear there, and they start speaking in, it's not unknown tongues, it's actually known tongues. All of the different, different languages, languages from around the world. Understand. Yeah, everybody can understand it. You know, and that's something else, you know, if you study Acts, you have to understand. You make sure to point out, it wasn't unknown tongues that they spoke in that day. It was known tongues from around the world, okay? <laughs> But the biggest thing of, uh, of most importantly, that when the wind comes and the tongues of fire appear, who do they appear above? Who do they appear above that, that day? They appeared above the disciples, right? But who else did they appear above? Acts tells us that the, it was full of people. There were more than just the disciples there. 
that there were all believers. All kinds of believers were there when all this happened. But now look in John chapter 20, once again here in verse 22. The only ones we believe are in the house that night are who? The disciples, okay? But most importantly, what is the manner in which Jesus gives them the Holy Spirit? He does what? He breathes. He breathes on them. There's not a wind. There's not fire. He breathes on them. Okay. Now, to understand a little bit more, what two Old Testament events should this action by Jesus now bring to our mind? There's two Old Testament events. The first one occurs in Genesis. Where, you know, he breathed on them. In Genesis chapter 2, who gets breathed on? Or breathed in? Adam does. Remember how does it happen? In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. All right, that's the first one. Now there's a second Old Testament you know, then this is found in Ezekiel chapter 37. Does anybody remember what happens in Ezekiel chapter 37? What's the story, huh? The valley, the valley of the dry bones. Now, you don't have to flip back to it. I've got it marked. And but what it says here, like in verse 1 of chapter 37 of Ezekiel, the hand of the Lord came upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. Then in verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, thus says the Lord God, uh, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet a vast multitude. This is the story, part of the story of the valley of dry bones. Now, the thing is this. In the Genesis passage, God breathes life into Adam, okay? In the Ezekiel passage, God breathes life into those who have been killed, those or basically those who are dead. And what this is about is Ezekiel's prophecy that God is one day going to restore the Jewish people and take them back to the promised land. He's going to restore their life and bring them back to the promised land, okay? So there's two different things, you know, that we can look at this. That's the reason why that the belief of most Bible scholars is that John, John is not seeking to combine both stories. He's not putting the resurrection story and the story of Pentecost together. No, it's believed that what Jesus does here, according to John, it's completely separate from what God will do with the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So it's not the same thing. So what's going on here? No, it's believed that with Jesus did breathing on the disciples, giving them the Holy Spirit, that what he does is to, he does this for two very specific reasons. First off, Jesus is now who? He's also the giver of life. Jesus, who is the giver of life, is now breathing new life into these disciples. But not just any new life. That what he's doing, he's breathing in, into them a new life of ministry. Giving them this. That in his own way, Jesus is now giving to them their own personal gift of resurrection. To go forth into a new life and taking the message of the gospel of Christ out into the world. But then secondly, that with Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit upon the disciples, he's doing more than just sending them out. He's actually giving them two things. First off, he's giving them power. The power that they would need to go forth and do what he's calling them to do. As I, you know, God sent me, I send you. Jesus could not send the disciples out without giving them, first off, the power to do so. Okay? But secondly, most important, I like this. By breathing upon them, Jesus is not just giving them power. Jesus is also now giving what to the disciples? The Holy Spirit. Okay, more than just the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit, but that means that Jesus is also giving them what? 
A part of what? Heaven. Part of heaven? Yeah. Part of himself. Let's look at it that way. That with the Holy Spirit, because remember, they are the three in one. Jesus is actually in his own way. He's giving himself to these disciples. The thing is, if Jesus has sent the disciples out without giving them power, without giving them a part of himself, you know, if he'd have done that, what do you think would have happened? What would have happened with the disciples? They would have been doomed to what? Failure. To failure. But most importantly, they would not have been ready for what? What's coming in 50 days? Pentecost. They would not have been ready for the receiving of the, of the Holy Spirit so that they can do, go forth, speak in the known tongues, and truly begin the mission, all right? But see, it started for the disciples. For all of us, it starts on Pentecost. For the disciples themselves, it starts right here. Jesus is giving them power, and he's giving them a part of himself, saying, I breathe upon you and give you my Holy Spirit. And so he's doing this, you know, but by breathing upon the disciples, Jesus is also giving them two other things. He's ensuring this, that through the sharing of the gospel message, that the disciples are in fact, first off, bringing new life to who now? Who will the disciples be taking new life to? Whoever they meet, taking it to the lost, those of the world. If you're lost, lost in your sins, you're dying, just like Genesis 2, 7, 1. God breathed life into Adam. They're going to be breathing life now into the world, into the lost. But think about it this way. Through the teaching, through teaching the world of all the things that Jesus taught them about how he came to save us from the power of sin, from the power of death, along with how Jesus has opened up the way to not just a new life, but a new relationship with God. The bottom line is this. All who receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, now have the promise also of what? Remember Ezekiel 37? It is the prophecy that one day the Jewish people will be brought back to life and taken back to where? Israel. The Israel, the promised land. For those who receive Christ, receive not just new life, they, we receive the promise of receiving our what? What are we going to receive? Eternal life. Eternal life. We're going to receive our promised land. See, heaven's our promised land, y'all. And so that's, you know, comes about. We receive a part of Jesus, and they're going to be giving new life, a message of new life, a message of you will be restored and get and receive the gift of the promised land. And that's so that's what this is really about, is that this is not Pentecost. This is not the coming of the Holy Spirit for everybody. This was just the first step for the disciples in getting ready to go take the message out. Then look at verse 23. Now with this verse, it definitely sounds like Jesus is not only giving the disciples complete power to forgive all persons' sins. Look at the verse 23. It also sounds like that Jesus is giving them complete power to do what? To forgive sins. Okay, not only the power to forgive sins, but also giving them the power to do what? What's the other part to it? There's two parts to that verse 23. Alright, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So when you read it, it sounds like Jesus is not only giving the disciples complete power to forgive all sins, he's also giving them the complete power to not forgive a person's sins. But now wait a minute. The last time I looked in the Bible, last time I heard about this, what's the catch? So I was always taught what that no human being has the absolute power to forgive or not forgive a person of all their sins. Now, I can forgive you if you do what? Sin against me. You do something against me, I have all the power to forgive you or not forgive you. But the Bible, what we're taught is that God forgives. That Jesus is the one that forgives us of all of our sins. It doesn't say anything about us being able to do it. 
So what could Jesus really be saying to these disciples? Well, see, it's believed that what Jesus is saying to the disciples is that they now have the complete power and authority to proclaim what? They can now go out in complete power and authority and proclaim the what? The Word of God. The Word of God, which is about the what? They can proclaim, what did Jesus just say to you? What did he talk about? Forgiveness of sins. They have complete power and authority to go forth and proclaim the forgiveness of sins through belief and acceptance of Jesus Christ. But just as importantly, they also now have the power to do what? Uh, to, or to think, yes, to tell people, you know, that they also have the power to warn people. That if you do not turn away from your sins, if you refuse the power of God's forgiveness, then you will not have that forgiveness. If that's what this is really about, then he's letting you know you have the power, the authority to give this message. That if a person comes and they can receive forgiveness, but you also have the power to let them know, well, if you, if you turn your back on Jesus, you turn your back on God and do not receive forgiveness, then your sins will not be forgiven. See, what Jesus is doing here is now charging the disciples with the ultimate message and power of the gospel. That's what the gospel is, is about. Forgiveness, the love of God, the power of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. But it is also be understood that for those who turn their back, those who reject it will not be forgiven of their sin. I like what Dr. Job said. In his commentary, he writes this. The disciples are now charged to announce with complete certainty and authority that sins are forgiven only on the basis of faith in Jesus, but also that sins are retained in the face of unbelief. God himself stands behind the preaching of the disciples, granting or withholding forgiveness as persons respond to their message about Jesus. They have the message about Jesus. They have the complete power and authority to proclaim the message of forgiveness. But with that also comes the complete power and authority to let people know, if you refuse forgiveness, then you are condemned to death. And so there's you know, some very powerful things that are going on here with all this. Now, but then let's finish this up. So join me looking at verses 24 through 29. See if we can finish this up. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put his finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although, although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it, on my, put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. All right. Now, as we're looking at this, as we're looking at the whole story, especially verses 19 through 23, and then looking right there at verse 24, from 19, verse 19 through verse 24, what's the first thing that is missing in the story? What's missing from what we've read? I read to you 19 through 23, just read the next part, but just there in verse 24, along with the first part. What's the first thing that's missing in the story? We're not told the reason why. Why Thomas wasn't there. Why Thomas wasn't there. You ever thought about that? We're never told the reason why Thomas was not with the disciples that night when Jesus first revealed himself to them. Now, we don't really know. We'll never really know until we get to heaven. But one commentator put it like this. Maybe the reason is that, first off, that for Thomas... The cross had done its job. All right? The cross had done, the cross had worked, whatever it was. And Thomas is simply now the kind of person who likes to do what? 
who wants to mourn and grieve how? Alone. And you can't blame them for that. I, mean, I know a lot of people. Some people, misery loves company kind of stuff. Some people just want to say, leave me alone. I've got to deal with this in my own way. Thomas might have been that way, okay? But the thing is this, if that is the case, then we may also now have the answer to the next question that should always come up. We should always ask this question when we're looking at this story. What would that next question be? Why didn't Thomas what? Believe enough. Believe. Okay, so yeah, why did he not believe even enough? Why didn't Thomas believe what the other disciples told him about seeing Jesus? Well, let's be honest. And let's look at this from Thomas's point of view, okay, where Thomas is coming from. First off, think about it. When it comes to the act of crucifixion, throughout the history of Rome, the act of crucifixion, crucifixion how many people survived being crucified? No. None. None. <laughs> It was a death sentence. Nobody lived. Secondly, thinking about Thomas, it can be understood that someone being raised from the dead was not something that what? Happened every day. Wasn't common. It wasn't a common event, all right? Maybe this with Thomas. To Thomas, maybe he just simply thought that the other disciples had just been overcome with wishful thinking, mass hysteria type stuff. They had just convinced themselves. But it hadn't really happened. Or, what was we talked about last week? One of the things that John makes sure to point out when Jesus appeared, that he did not show up as a what? Do you remember? As a ghost or a spirit. Maybe he's thinking, well, it was just a spirit. It was a ghost. Or maybe most importantly, he's still in the place where Peter and John were. Look back in chapter 20, verse 9. Go back in this chapter. Look at verse 9. Remember what happened to Peter and John. They still what? There in verse 9 of chapter 20. Peter and John still did not what? Understand the scripture. Understand the scripture. Maybe he just still at that point, he doesn't understand the scriptures. He still doesn't understand everything that Jesus told him. So for me, looking at this from Thomas's point of view, yes, sir? Do you think we understand? Not always. That's, and this is yeah. where There's faith comes in. Yeah. That we don't understand. Sometimes, yeah, there are a lot of things we don't you know, understand. Thomas was not any different from us. Very right. Very good. That's right. Thomas was still a human being. A person thinking from a human point of view at this point, okay? And that's right. How many times have I just said, I, I don't understand God, but it's a, I'm going to trust in you. Amen. But for me, the big question is this thing. And looking at this from what would have been Thomas's point of view, did Thomas actually do anything wrong then when he doubted? No. No. Should Thomas forever be marked with that title, Doubting Thomas? I don't believe so. For me, there are four reasons as to why we should not condemn Thomas. First off, first let's go back once again to the physical evidence. The physical evidence was there. He was crucified. It's a death sentence. Secondly, the second reason why we shouldn't do them is because we know this for a fact. Thomas loves Jesus. We know for a fact that Thomas did love Jesus. How do we know this? All right, think back in the Gospel of John. We studied this story, but they went through it with a fine tooth comb. What major life and death and life again event also occurred within the ministry of Jesus? where we see Thomas step up and do something. What other big event involves somebody living, dying, and living again? Who was his name? Lazarus. Lazarus. And if you remember, you don't. I, if you want to flip back to John chapter 11, you can. John chapter 11, verses 15 and 16. You know, or at the last part of verse 14, you know, Jesus tells him plainly Lazarus is dead. Then he says here, for your sake I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. You see, the thing is, here without hesitation, we see that Thomas is not only willing to go with Jesus 
into enemy territory. Remember, this was going back into Jerusalem area, where the temple was, where the religious leaders were. You know, they were going to Bethany, which was a suburb. They're going back into enemy territory. But also, he loved Jesus so much, he was also willing to what? Die. To die. To die with him. So we know that he loved him. But third, let's be honest. How many times have you been told something in your life and instantly you said, it can't be? I don't believe. But then a few days later, you discovered what? It was true. It was true. How many times are you and I guilty of the exact same thing? So here's three very simple reasons why. But I want us to look at the fourth one. To me, the fourth and most compelling reason as to why we should not condemn Thomas for being such a doubter. Look at verses 20, 26 and 27, okay? Look at 26 and 27. Now, look at the two verses. And as you read 26 and 27, within these two verses, what is the second thing that is missing from the story? What's the second thing missing in verses 26 and 27? Didn't tell us how Thomas caught up with the disciples. All right, but there's something else there. Now, okay, well, that's just part of the story. But there's something basic, something very specific, a second thing that is also, Jesus never once does what to Thomas? Huh? Okay, basically, he, yeah, very good. He doesn't condemn Thomas as far as what? His doubt. Jesus didn't condemn him. Jesus didn't pop in, peace be with you. Now, Thomas, why would you doubt what I said? Why would you doubt what your friends told you? Not one time Jesus never once tries to punish him. He doesn't condemn Thomas for his doubt. Instead, Jesus does what Jesus always does. He came in. He says to them all, peace be with you. And then he immediately does what? He turns to who? To Thomas. He comes directly to Thomas and gives to Thomas what? Exactly what he needed at that moment. Thomas has said, I need to touch him. And Jesus didn't condemn him. Instead, Jesus says, okay, Thomas, this is what you need. This is what Jesus does for all of us. He comes to us at the moment we need him and gives to us exactly what we need. That's what he did to Thomas. Now, the thing is, that with all this, the question has always been, did Thomas do it? Did he touch the nail-scarred hand? Did he touch the wound in his side? Now, according to the tradition and belief of the early church, he did it. It was the original belief and teaching of the early church that not only did Thomas do it, but the other disciples did it as well. They used to teach this, you see, and the reason why they believed this is because they saw it as, as the moment. As the moment when the disciples joined their flesh and blood to the flesh and blood of Jesus. That he was, they were reconnecting themselves physically to Jesus now. All right? But for most of us today, we do not believe that Thomas did it. We don't believe it because we believe this. If, we believe that if he had, John would have told us about it. Because this would have been Thomas's moment to do what? If he had actually reached out and touched him, that would have been Thomas's moment to instantly do what? To do what with Jesus? To believe him. That would have been his moment to believe. But look at verse 28. Instead, John tells us about Thomas's moment of belief in what way? When Thomas cries out what? My Lord and my God. It's at this moment that the one who has been given the title as doubter, suddenly now he's giving us what? One of the greatest what? Confidence is yes, statement of faith. One of the greatest statement of faith found in the Bible. And it's one of the greatest statements of faith because Thomas is now doing two things with this. First off, with his words, Thomas, Thomas is acknowledging the truth the reality of what has happened. That he 
has seen God. That he's seen God. That Jesus has been what? That he Resurrected. Been. Raised from He has seen God. Okay? But secondly, with his words, Thomas is also doing what? Thomas is also acknowledging the complete revelation as to who Jesus is. Because Jesus is also who? God, he is Lord and God. That's one of the things that makes it so great. That he is acknowledging it's true, he's resurrected, but Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. But look at it on more of a personal level. You know, with his words, he's what? He's also making a personal confession. Basically what Thomas is now saying to Jesus is this. You are my Lord. You are my you know, with the use of that personal pronoun, my. Thomas is now confessing to Jesus, I now belong to you. He's now saying to Jesus, Jesus, I'm your willing servant. I will serve you. I will go. I will do wherever it is you want me to go. I will do whatever it is you want me to do because you're now my Lord and you are my God. And so it's a beautiful thing that suddenly Thomas is seeing all this. But then let's finish it up. Look at verse 29. Now here in verse 29, Jesus is now giving us his personal description, his personal definition of what? This is his personal description, personal de definition of what, of what should be, of what faith should be. This is Jesus' personal definition of what true faith can and should be. Now, in reading this, it's obvious that Jesus wants us to come to him through what kind of faith? A faith that does what? Believe. Believes instead of what? Actually see. See, okay. A faith that comes from, you know, not seeing, but comes from believing. But as we look at Jesus' words, what is now the third thing? That's been missing from the story. What's the third thing missing? Jesus is not doing what? When it concerning Thomas, what Thomas is doing at that moment, Jesus still does not do what with Thomas's faith? He doesn't reject it. Jesus is not rejecting Thomas's faith in him. Jesus is not condemning the way that Thomas came to have faith in him. Now, this is important because think about it. If Jesus had condemned the way that Thomas came to have faith in him, then Jesus would have also had to then do what? If he condemned, huh? Condemn well, not us. He would have had to condemn who? Not us, but who? Who else was there that night? The disciples. The disciples. You ever thought about that? If he had gotten on to Thomas for having faith that way, he'd have to turn around and do the same thing to the disciples. He would have had to condemn them as well. He would have had to condemn them because they have the same faith in him. But Thomas says, because they saw him. The other disciples came to believe in the same way, okay? Now the question becomes, does this mean that the faith of Thomas and the other disciples did, is it an inferior, lesser faith? No, no, you're right. No, it's not, okay? No, it does not because the faith that the disciples received from personally seeing Jesus, it becomes what for you and me? Their faith has become what for you and me? It's become our foundational faith. It's become the foundational faith upon which the gospel of Christ is now being proclaimed and lived out. If it hadn't been for their faith, we would not have faith. We will not have this. All right, once again, let me read to you what Dr. Joe says in his book. The story of Thomas shows that the entire band of apostles, including the one who resisted most strenuously the report of Jesus' resurrection, saw the Lord and came to believe firmly that he had been raised from the dead. Now listen to what Dr. Joe says here. All who hear their message can be assured of its truthfulness and will be blessed if they believe. We have faith because of the faith that first came to the disciples. Even though their faith came by seeing, they laid the foundation for our faith. 
And so it's not a lesser faith. It's not a, an inferior faith. Their faith is important too. It helps us have our faith. But there's one last thing concerning Thomas that I want to point out. That even though we should not condemn Thomas for his doubts, Thomas did make one mistake. He made one mistake. What mistake do you think Thomas made? If you had to make a guess, what would you say is, what would be the mistake that you think that Thomas made in all of these? His mistake was simply this, separating himself from the fellowship of his fellow disciples. That was his mistake. See, we miss out a lot in our lives when we make the choice to separate ourselves from fellow believers. That is why, you know, when we find ourselves isolated, you're in pain. You're in trouble. You're in doubt. That is where we do not need to separate ourselves, but instead seek the fellowship of the church. Seek the fellowship of other Christians because there's strength and renewal of faith when we seek fellowship with other believers. Because through the faith we can gather with other believers, our faith in who becomes stronger? In Christ, in Jesus. Let's think about it. Thomas missed out on a great blessing. He missed the blessing Easter Eve because he separated himself from his fellow disciples. That's his one mistake. So if we're going to get on to Thomas about something, if we're going to talk to him about something, we can talk to him about that. Let's don't doubt him. But let's understand the fact that we can learn from his mistake. All right, so we're going to pick up with chapter 21 next week. And we'll continue on. We're almost finished. This is the last chapter, chapter 21. All of you at home, I want to thank you for being here with us tonight. I hope those of you have uh, got our phone message. You've got the list of some of the names. And I invite you to stop for a few minutes as soon as the camera's off once again. And just take some time to pray for all of us here at the church and all these needs. Until we're together again, take care and God bless. Thank you again and goodbye.